Welcome to Veterans for Peace Saturday night keynote and additional events. Thank you so much for joining us. We begin with Strong Buffalo, who will give us greetings. He is a member of the Sussitan, Wapitan, Dakota, and a decorated Vietnam veteran. Strong Buffalo has been writing poetry before there was anything called American Indian poetry, starting last century. His words translated in more than 17 languages, three published books, eight CDs, along with lectures and performances, contribute to a world where we use creativity and options other than war, racism, classism, and exploitation to solve problems that we all share just by being alive. It is my pleasure to introduce Strong Buffalo. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I am, um, my, my name is Tatanka Oitika. That's translated as Strong Buffalo. Actually means a buffalo who's um, brave so much he's strong. And uh, I'm, I am a Dakota or one of the, the friendly people. And I'll, I'll just do a couple poems. Um, this first one is called Origin, Agent Orange, White and Blue. While the enemy was digging hidden underground caves to hide from the United States systematic chemical war to force out the guerrilla, the smart men of war forgot or intentionally allowed their own sons to stand above breathing the agent brother's stench. I am now the son of Dioxin, and you shall see me groping out of hidden underground caves looking for you, Uncle Sam. I'm a Vietnam vet. I was in seven operations in Vietnam, uh, starting with Way, and uh, I'm a wounded, decorated veteran. Uh, in Vietnam, I began to uh, realize the fertility of war and have been working for peace since. In 1984, uh, I first encountered with uh, Veterans for Peace and we went on a mission down to uh, Nicaragua to uh, normalize the relationship with uh, the Sandinistas. And I was working for the International Union Treaty Council, which is an NGO in the U United Nations for uh, American, 100 American Indian nations. And uh, we were releasing uh, 500 mosquito uh, prisoners of war. And I was um, also went to Libya to try to normalize peace there. This one uh, I'll close with. Uh, I'm a proud member of Chapter 27 here in the Twin Cities. And um, contrary to what people believe, Minnesota is not a Norwegian word. It is uh, a Dakota word. And it means uh, the, the land where the water reflects the sky blue water. This one is uh, a poem I wrote uh, called Hidden Falls. The world has ended before. Four times the world has died from fire, floods, cold and dry. This fourth world of ours was to have lasted forever, forevermore. But greed has led us to this point where all four legs of the buffalo are gone. We need to talk. We need to talk about it all and make the corrections necessary. The only thing different in this world now is that we are here. The only thing different in this world is that we are in this world now. So we need to make our lives 
stronger, make our spirit stronger, because directions change. And please, stand up tall for Mother Earth, child. Please, stand up tall for Mother Earth, child. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our keynote speaker tonight, Claire Daly, is an Irish politician who has been a member of the European Parliament from Ireland for the Dublin constituency since July 2019. She is a member of Independence for Change, part of the left of the European Parliament. Special thanks to Claire for her incredible and wonderful support of two of our Veterans for Peace members who spent several months in Ireland for protesting the United States transport of troops and weapons through Shannon Airport. Claire Daly, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. It's a, an absolute honor for me to be here with you all. I have to be honest, it's August. I don't normally break my holidays for anybody, but when I got the invitation from Veterans for Peace, I knew I had to make an exception. Um, firstly, because in general, I have a total admiration for the work that you do. But secondly, because of precisely the work of Ken and Tarek, that we know that we owe you Ireland having interned them both almost for almost a year for having the audacity to try and search US warplanes coming through our civilian airport in Shannon. So Veterans for Peace really have a special place in the traditions of Irish peace and neutrality. So it's my honor to be with you. Although if I had read the fine print and realized that it would be in the middle of the night for me here in Brussels, maybe I wouldn't have been, and maybe I won't be at my best, but if I'm not in my heart, it's the only place I'd want to be tonight because I think your conference is taking place at an incredibly appropriate time. Exactly 18 months from the start of the war in Ukraine or Russia's unprovoked war of aggression, as it's called repeatedly, on our airwaves, repeated time and again, which kind of gives you a clue that the war actually was provoked. That doesn't mean that it was justified. Russia had no right to invade the sovereign territory of Ukraine. This was 100% illegal, but it was provoked. And unless we understand that, then there can be no solution to the conflict that takes place, that is taking place there currently. Because the backdrop to the war of Ukraine, in Ukraine is the continued expansion of NATO since the end of the Soviet Union and in breach of the promises made at that time. 14 countries joined. Every time another country joined NATO, every Russian president said, this is an existential threat to our security. Yet it was ignored. Even US officials pointed out that the idea of Ukraine joining NATO would be a red line for Russia along the lines of the Bay of Pigs for the US or if, for example, Russia sighted missiles on the borders in Canada. Yet in 2008, George Bush, said that Ukraine and Georgia would join NATO. In 2014, the US was responsible and involved in the coup inside Ukraine. And there's no doubt about it that the current war that is raging, even as we speak here now, is a result of the conscious policy of NATO to encircle and goad Russia. Unfortunately, Putin responded to that provocation and gave them everything that they wanted. NATO has been rescued from obscurity. Europe is now firmly a vassal state of the US, not a potential uh, rival, not a potential ally of others, 
there had been a belief that when the UK left the EU, that this would be an impetus for an EU army, the UK having been the biggest supporters of NATO inside the EU. But instead, what we see is NATO really now is the only show in town in Europe. Countries like Sweden and Finland, which to be honest were nominally neutral, but now have firmly joined the NATO camp. And even in Ireland, my own country, where the people are proud of their neutrality, we see the Irish government under pressure of the war in Ukraine, now wanting to have what they call a conversation about our neutrality. They never wanted a conversation when I was in the Irish Parliament, when we wanted to talk about our neutrality being undermined by the systemic use of our civilian airport by the US military on its ways to war in the Middle East and beyond. They never wanted it then, but now they say our neutrality is not fit for purpose. They talk about us trying to eliminate and undermine the triple lock, which is a mechanism by which the Irish military only engage in action overseas with the authorization of the Irish parliament, the Irish government, and only under a UN mandate. And if that's not fit for purpose, well, the only purpose it's not fit for is engaging in missions which don't have a UN mandate. And why would a neutral country want anything to do with that? But unfortunately, the war in Ukraine has given an impetus to undermining our traditional neutrality. We also see that the war has given an unleashing of military budgets across Europe. They are now on steroids. Obviously, nobody would be mad enough to have a situation where we'd spend taxpayers' money, which is just so badly needed for housing, health, education, and so on, on militarism and destruction. Nobody would buy that lunacy. So they've got to make people afraid make people think that the enemy is out there. And unfortunately, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has given them that excuse. Five years ago, the European Union first decided on having a direct military fund. The European Union was never supposed to be a military project. So the European Defence Fund, which was set up five years ago, it did have a budget of eight billion. They set up the Orwellian named European Peace Facility, which actually is to allow the European Union to sell arms to African countries. Uh, with that, nothing to do with peace at all. Come on, to so, It's fixed. I don't know if people can hear me or I heard. No, people can hear you. Somebody who was unmuted was talking, but they have been muted. Cool. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay. So that, that threw me a bit. But anyway, so we had the European Peace Facility. We had military mobility. Uh, really, they didn't get as much money as they wanted at that time. But now, since the war in Ukraine, the floodgates are open. We have European commissioners talking about Europe being involved in a war economy. We've had labor laws suspended to enable the 24 seven production of shells to go to the battlefields in Ukraine at the cost of three to 4,000 euros per shell. We have the German economy, which traditionally didn't spend money on arms, now pumping billions into the military industrial complex. And we now know that the new Cold War has really become very hot indeed. And this is of course, lunacy. It's a game, it's an experiment, it's a racket by the military industrial complex where Ukraine is simply being used as a prop or as a stage. I'm actually ironically on the Ukraine's hit list of Russian propagandists and my crime and the reason why I'm on it is that I said two things, the first being that it was the ordinary people who were suffering the brunt of sanctions, which I can tell you is absolutely true, as Europeans face a massive cost of living uh, and energy crisis battle. 
Um, but my second crime was in saying that the war was a proxy war. Now, I have no problem in repeating that now loudly and sadly, proudly, but this is the quintessential definition of a proxy war. And even as the dust settles and the jingoism and the nonsense dies down a bit, the truth is beginning to emerge, even occasionally in the mainstream media. And we've had recently articles in the Financial Times, for example, and I'll just quote from it briefly, where they talk about the war in Ukraine being the first time that NATO weaponry is being used on a large scale against the Russian army. And it's giving Western militaries invaluable insight into its performance. Kiev's Western allies can actually see if their weapons work, how efficiently they work, if they need to be upgraded. For the military industries of the world, you can't invest in a better testing ground, says the Ukraine's Minister of Defence. Now I ask you, what comfort is that for the women and children of Ukraine whose sons and fathers and husbands have died in such a good cause? We also see the counter-offensive, so-called, which is failing abysmally in Ukraine, and we now have US officials bemoaning the fact that the Ukrainians are becoming, as they call it, casualty averse. In other words, these ungrateful Ukrainians are not prepared to go headlong into minefields under siege of Russian artillery. The absolute cheek of them, how dare they, after the West have given them so much weaponry. This is the type of disgusting, rhetoric that we are really seeing creeping in now. And it is unmasking the realities and the horrors of the war in Ukraine, where cluster munitions are being used. This is the definition of a proxy war, where ordinary Ukrainians and ordinary Russians are doing the dying by Armchair generals, either in Moscow or in Washington or in Brussels, sit and try and direct their troops. It is absolutely appalling. And this war has nothing to do with helping Ukrainians. It's nothing to do with a battle between democracy and authoritarianism. Come on. Ukraine, one of the most corrupt countries in the world, where opposition parties were banned, trade unions undermined and workers' rights eliminated, the country sold off to foreign owners, nothing democratic about it. And the horrific stories where there, those with money can buy their way out and buy false disability papers, while the authorities round up poor people and disabled people and send them to the front as cannon fodder. It's an absolute appalling nightmare. And yet don't have to be a genius to know that how could keeping a war going possibly help anybody in Ukraine? It doesn't. It's only resulted in 500,000 dead or injured Ukrainians, millions displaced, cities leveled, territories annexed. It's a meat grinder, as those of you in Veterans for Peace know only too well. War is never stopped by more war. It's only stopped by peace. Yet everything in the media and amongst the establishment politicians has been done to stymie peace, to make sure that peace doesn't happen. And those of us who argue for peace are labeled as Putin puppets, as Kremlin agents at best. We're not anti-war, seemingly. We're anti-Ukrainian. This is ridiculous. This is an insult. Before this war, everybody knew, and it was an established wisdom and practice, that you never send arms into a conflict. That's the last thing that you do. Yet now we're told, of course, that's what you have to do. You have to stand up to a bully. Well, let's look at that. They never send arms to the people of Yemen fighting against the Saudis. They never stand up 
and send arms to the people in Palestine who every day face a vicious and appalling onslaught by the Israeli state. I never saw or heard them argue for the arming of the IRA to get the British out of Ireland. Instead, they got behind a peace agreement in Ireland. In Ireland, a peace agreement and fighting for peace wasn't doing nothing. It actually was a lot of work. And the same people now who are arguing that Ukraine has to win back every bit of its territory, including Crimea, where everybody knows the people want to be part of Russia, that this has to be done before there can be peace. These are the same people who laud the peace agreement in Northern Ireland as an historic achievement, where 17% of the island of Ireland is still under British rule and hundreds of thousands of Irish people are ruled by an administration that they don't believe represents them. But you know what? People aren't getting killed every day. There's a roadmap in that agreement for how issues can be resolved in terms of the United Ireland in the future, how minority rights can be addressed, and that's enshrined in that agreement. And last April, there was such an agreement for Ukraine, where they're in return for a withdrawal of Russia back to the pre-February um, 2022 boundaries in return for Ukrainian neutrality and non-NATO membership. There was a process over 10 to 15 years where the issues in Donetsk and in Crimea could be resolved. But that was scuppered by the West, who told Ukraine to keep fighting. This is about US strategic interests against Russia, and it's about the profits of the military industrial complex, nothing else. Well over 100 billion euros from Western countries in military and humanitarian aid has gone into Ukraine. Now we know and you know that Biden wants another 25 billion, even as he stands by and allow the people of Hawaii suffer the devastation there without such similar support at all. And where is that money going? It's going to corrupt elites in Ukraine. It's staying in the US and Europe and lining the pockets of the military industrial complex. And the other money that's going in to so-called rebuild the society in Ukraine is going to be paid for by people in Ukraine and people in Europe for eternity. And already people are paying with the cost of living crisis in Europe. The fact that we in Europe now pay four times the amount for our LNG than um, you do in the US. So this war, like all others, is patently against the interests of ordinary people. And that has to be the basis of our resolve to make sure that we do whatever we can to bring it to an end. We know and can take solace from the fact that the situation is beginning to change as ordinary people see that this war is going nowhere. And that does make our job easier. And I think we should take great heart from the fact that the situation as I've outlined in terms of NATO and European military expenditure is makes the situation difficult. It does make the peace movement difficult, but that is the situation in the global north. It may seem like we are isolated and we are a minority, but actually on the world scale, we represent the majority of the world's people. NATO, that parasite, which is responsible for three quarters of the global military expenditure, is beginning to learn a very valuable lesson. Be careful what you wish for, because rather than them succeeding in isolating Russia and establishing Western dominance and authority, what they have actually done in the present conflict is the opposite. We are on the verge now of a new world order where US hegemony has had its day. The present juncture is a sign not of their strength, but of their weakness. 
and the countries which represent the majority of the world's population have had enough. They're not prepared to be dominated by empire or the old colonial European powers any longer. They've been refusing throughout this dispute to be dragged into taking sides in the war in Ukraine. Not because they don't care about Ukraine, not because they support Russia, but because they've seen more. They've seen the role of empire of the US with 750 military bases in 80 countries, of being involved in war for most of its history. They're sick of the US abusing its position of the dollar and penalizing and pauperizing and murdering people with sanctions. China has always been the US's main target at the present juncture, not because they represent a threat to US security, because they threaten, represent a threat to US economic dominance. And the hope that Taiwan would become a new Ukraine, I think is a vain hope. We've seen the answer to that. In the last week, the BRICS nations have become bigger. New members joining, even with US allies of Argentina, Ethiopia, Egypt, all joining that alliance, not because they're anti-empire, but as a move to be anti the dominance of the dollar. The BRICS countries now represent 46% of the world's population, 3.7 billion people with a GDP greater than $30 trillion and 80% of oil production. What we now see is multipolarity and international law having an opportunity to be reborn rather than the misnamed rules-based international order, which is just a cover for US dominance. That doesn't mean that the world stage we're at now is straightforward. Empire is in decline. That makes it quite a dangerous time. But what we do see in the new developments on a global scale is the potential for a way forward. We see in Niger, where the people of Africa again and again are rejecting the remnants of French colonialism, robbing them of their assets. They don't want to see bases in their country. Echo was, isn't fully dancing to the Western tune. It's not uh, plain sailing, but these movements do show a way forward. They show the potential for a new world where all countries can be treated equally, multi multipolarity and international law respected. And against that backdrop, countries like Ireland could play a great role. And it's a tragedy and an embarrassment for me that rather than using our unique position as a country which was colonized and occupied, and yet firmly in the Western camp, we could use our unique position for good, but we don't do that. We've bent the knee to US empire, we've handed our airports over, and we've now gone along with the bureaucracy in Brussels. That isn't good enough. But the positive side on it is despite the efforts of our establishment to undermine our neutrality, the people don't want that. The people have seen through it. They're speaking out against it. And even though there will be efforts made to bring us further down the line of being in the uh, EU camp, I think the people will resist that. And I take great confidence from that. So I think we should really go from this event reinvigorated to tell the truth. We know that Julian Assange, whose thoughts we should and best wishes we should send from this event, coined a phrase that if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by the truth. And he was so right, because our power rests in telling the truth. That's why we are being attacked like never before. We all know the old phrase that truth is the first casualty of war. It has always been so. We know the Iraq war was started by the lies of weapons of mass destruction and so on. 
And yet, even then, there was a space for an anti-war voice. You could make the argument and it would be engaged with. But in, in this war, all you need to do is argue for peace to be labelled as a potent puppet. That's how bad things have got. This is McCarthyism on steroids. But the reason why they're clamping down so hard on us is because they realise that this is the voice of peace and this is the solution. It's for us to tell the truth and organise people power across the Western world, which will be totally in tandem with the voices of those of the global South. So look, at it's my absolute honour to be here with you to offer solidarity and best greetings in the struggle for an end to empire and for international solidarity and peace. We totally respect the work of Veterans for Peace and look forward to soldiering with you side by side in a world where the resources can be shared by all equally, where we come together to fight the battles against climate change and global destruction, rather than pitting working class people against each other across national boundaries. So I'd really like to salute the work that you do and offer my full support to it in the months and years ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claire. And thank you for joining us in the middle of your vacation and in the middle of the night. We so appreciate hearing your voice and hearing from you. And thank you again for your ongoing and continuous support of Veterans for Peace, both when we appear in your country and in this United States. Your words are truly inspiring to all of us. Thank you. Our next guest is Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Jeffrey Sachs is University Professor and Director of the Center of Sustainable Development of Columbia University, where he directed the Earth Institute from 2002 until 2016. He is president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, co-chair of the Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition, commissioner of the UN Broadband Commission for Development, academician of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences at the Vatican, um, and Transi Jeffrey Chia, honorary distinguished professor at Sunway University. He has been special advisor to three United Nations Secretaries General and currently serves as an SDG advocate under Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He spent over 20 years as a professor at Harvard University, where he received his BA, MA, and PhD degrees. It is an honor and wonderful to welcome you, Professor Sachs. Thank you. For peace. Thank you so much. Well, I'm uh, very honored to be with all of you and really delighted to follow uh, Claire Daly's wonderful remarks. It's so good to hear some wisdom coming from Europe because unfortunately the dominant discourse in Europe is like the dominant discourse in the United States uh, these days, which is uh, war all the time. And um, I've always counted on Europe to be smarter than the US on these matters because the US makes so many of these uh, awful, uh, unnecessary wars. Um, and I've been surprised and very, uh, very alarmed and disappointed by uh, the European leaders falling into line with the uh, US military industrial complex. And um, Claire, thank you. <laughs> it's just so, <clears throat> so good to hear uh, your, uh, your wonderful remarks. It's gotten very bad uh, in Europe as it has in the United States, very hard to reach 
the mainstream because the media, the corporate media have completely, completely blocked out any honest accounting of uh, how we got into the Ukraine war and what's happening and why it's a disaster. So it's very hard to uh, to to uh, even uh, share basic facts right now. I, I know I was pretty frequently on uh, just normal mainstream TV, but not these days, not in the last couple of years, because uh, nobody wants to hear. And I, I begged the New York Times even for one editorial to tell the truth about this war. And I kind of badgered them into accepting something and they accepted it, they edited it, they were getting ready to print it. And then they said, oh, I'm so sorry, Professor Sachs, we're not gonna run it after all. Uh, so the, the fact of the matter is, uh, the, the corporate mainstream media has, is just completely saturated with the US government propaganda. So with that backdrop, here we are uh, sharing some truth and sharing some thoughts together. Uh, I go back uh, more than 30 years uh, in Russia, Ukraine, uh, US, European issues because more than 30 years ago, I was uh, trying to help uh, President Gorbachev uh, and then trying to help President Yeltsin and then trying to help President Kuchma, the first president of independent Ukraine, to uh, uh, overcome all of the uh, huge difficulties that attended the the collapse of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapsed because it was a miserable system. It didn't work. Uh, and uh, Gorbachev knew it, and he wanted a normal society with normal relations with the US, and he wanted a common European home, and I loved the man for it. And when he asked me to be on his uh, advisory team, of course, I said yes. And I learned that the United States could not take yes for an answer. It could not accept the idea of just a normal cooperative relationship with a reformed Soviet Union or with an independent Russia. Uh, the US wanted unipolarity. The US wanted dominance. Uh, the US wants its way <coughs> on everything. It's crazy. We're 4.2% of the world. We don't and can't and shouldn't aspire to run the world. We should aspire to cooperate. Well, I, I saw firsthand in a very painful few years that the US doesn't like cooperation. First, it was uh, the Bush senior administration. Well, that was Cheney and Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld, the uh, the neocons of the day, and uh, they basically didn't want to lift one finger to help the transformation of Russia into a new uh, independent state that was peacefully integrated with its neighbors. Of course, they told lies. Uh, Gorbachev unilaterally said that he would disband the Soviet military alliance, the Warsaw Pact, and James Baker III, our Secretary of State at the time, and Hans Dietrich Genscher, the foreign minister of Germany, ran to Gorbachev, if you do this, uh, we will absolutely not take advantage of uh, the Soviet Union. We will absolutely uh, not move NATO into where the Warsaw Pact is right now. We will not move NATO one inch eastward. And there's a massive, wonderful archive of material with this promise repeated many times to Gorbachev by the Germans, by the US, by the Secretary General of NATO uh, himself uh, to a visiting Russian delegation. Well, turned out all to be lies because as soon as the Soviet Union uh, dissolved at the end of 1991, 
the neocons started planning the expansion of NATO because they couldn't take yes for an answer that we should just have peace and cooperation. They needed the expansion and, and who championed the expansion? Of course, the military industrial complex led the lobbying and it's not even subtle. Uh, the Raytheon top lobbyist was the head of the committee for the expansion of NATO. Well, duh, this was <coughs> money. We can sell weapons. We can expand our military bases. We can expand our military budget. And of course, these neocons had the idea that they would make several wars of choice. They actually decided that already in the 1990s that there would be several wars of choice because there was no one to oppose it. So uh, the US could depose all of the governments that were still aligned with Russia. That means uh, the Syrian government, the Libyan government, uh, the uh, Saddam Hussein and so forth. And they would find whatever excuse, whatever lies, uh, whatever alleged provocations to launch wars of choice. And of course, we know that this happened. But the real origin of the Ukraine war was this relentless NATO march eastward, <laughs> despite the core promises that were made and the core common sense, by the way, not just the promises, why provoke Russia? And when Clinton actually started the, uh, the, the machinery of NATO enlargement, his own Secretary of Defense, William Perry, thought about resigning in protest because he thought it was such a terrible idea that this would just lead to a new Cold War just at the time that relations were being normalized. And our top diplomats knew this. They understood this. Uh, Jack Matlock, the uh, US ambassador to the Soviet Union said, don't expand NATO. You said no, and it's only going to provoke. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, God, I get choked up over this. George Kennan, our top historian diplomat, the, the, the person who invented containment, that concept of the 1940s, he never wanted to be militarized in this way. And he absolutely said, this is the biggest mistake imaginable to start expanding NATO. Well, I watched a lot of this pretty close up. Uh, Clinton, kind of as usual, uh, not thinking very much, very short term thinking, uh, started uh, the NATO expansion in the 1990s. That was to Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic. The Russians were very unhappy, but it wasn't a big crisis. It wasn't on their border. Then Bush Jr. comes in, all the wars of choice. And not to mention, by the way, in 1999, Clinton bombs and not Clinton only, NATO bombs Belgrade for six straight weeks. Not exactly to Russia's liking, absolutely horrible. And uh, that worsened the relations further. Then in 2002, the neocons under Bush Jr. call for the unilateral US withdrawal from the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Unbelievable. The Russians said, stop, don't do this. This puts us in a threat. This destabilizes the <coughs> nuclear deterrence, which is our basis for just peacefully being able to trust each other and keeping on a path of denuclearization. Well, the US unilaterally withdraws and starts planning for placing missiles near Russia. And the Aegis missiles go into Poland and Romania within the next decade. Well, oh, the Russians are really getting pretty upset about this. And then George W. expands NATO to seven more countries in 2007. The three Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and Slovenia. And Putin, 
goes to the Munich Security Summit in 2007 and says, come on, stop, stop. You promised not one inch eastward, and now it's 10 countries you've expanded to. So the US in its uh, infinite wisdom as usual, what does it do? The next year, George W. Bush Jr. with, by the way, our US ambassador to NATO, Victoria Newland. I hope that name rings a bell. She's currently our deputy secretary of state. They call for NATO to enlarge further and where to the 2000 kilometer border with Russia, Ukraine, and to Georgia. Georgia, not the state, Georgia, the country on the eastern edge of the Black Sea. Look at a map, it ain't a North Atlantic country. But what it is, is a plan to surround Russia in the Black Sea. Because the idea was, and it was a very premeditated US idea, that with NATO enlargement, <coughs> NATO would be in Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia, completely surrounding Russia in the Black Sea. And notably, Russia's naval base in Sevastopol. And that was the idea. That, by the way, was the same idea of Lord Palmerston in 1853. So it's not a very original idea. It was the whole basis of the first Crimean War. And so these neocons wanted to fight the second Crimean War. And of course, you could hear the cheers of Britain, which is uh, imperialist nostalgia to the essence uh, in its political class. Yes, yes, yes. We could surround Russia and the Black Sea, just like Lord Palmerston wanted to do a century and a half earlier. Well, Putin says, do not do this. This could be incredibly destabilizing. But by the way, it wasn't just Putin who sent a secret memo back from Moscow to Washington to Condoleezza Rice. Well, of course, none other than Bill Burns. Bill Burns was then the US ambassador to Russia. But you may recall the name, he's currently our CIA director. And he sent a secret memo because everything in the US government is secret, by the way. He sent a secret memo entitled Niet means Niet. And he explained, <laughs> he explained something so basic, so obvious, that for Russia, this is a absolute hardcore bright red line do not go to Ukraine and that it's not just Putin it's the entire Russian society they don't want the U.S military bases they don't want Aegis missiles they do not want to be crowded on their border by the U.S military and it makes perfect sense because we wouldn't like it either but you know, Americans are American, not Americans, American security state leaders who don't ask us Americans. They're a little hard of hearing. So uh, did you say red line? We didn't hear that. So of course, Bush pushes through the commitment by NATO to expand to Ukraine and to Georgia. I know European leaders told me in 2008 what is your president doing but europe you know they're <coughs> i don't get it exactly but they will not oppose the us in public so they complained to me but then they in the end signed on to bush's crazy idea of expanding nato to ukraine and to georgia now there was one last safety valve to understand in this, and that is the Ukrainians did not want this. Ukraine is a divided society, ethnically Ukrainian, ethnically Russian. They didn't want this crowding. They knew that this would destabilize the situation. So the elected president, Viktor Yanukovych, said, we will be neutral. 
We will not alarm Russia also. We'll extend a lease in Crimea for the Sevastopol naval fleet until 2042. We want quiet. The United States neocons don't like quiet. They do. They want just to get their way. So in the end of 2013, they helped stoke first protests against Yanukovych, and then the violent overthrow of Yanukovych in February 2014. And we know that Victoria Nuland and Jake Sullivan and Joe Biden all played a role in the violent overthrow of the Ukrainian president. That's just a fact. Now, so much is hidden from view that we don't know exactly time and date, but the Russians intercepted one of Victoria Newland's phone calls and posted it on YouTube so everybody can listen to it as she and the US ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Piat, plot the next post Yanukovych government several weeks before a violent storming of the government buildings in Kiev. That's what happened. That's when the war started. We overthrew the government that wanted stability. And in came a series of governments that were Russophobic and pro-NATO and at the American <coughs> service. And Obama and Trump and Biden pumped in arms. Now, just to finalize uh, how we came to this current utter, utter tragedy and disaster. When Biden came in, I had hopes, okay, maybe something rational. No way. Biden doubled down on Ukraine becoming a NATO member, doubled down repeatedly in 2021, said NATO will enlarge to Ukraine. And on December 17th, 2021, Putin really at wit's end because he could not get the US to engage in diplomacy, put on the table, and you can find it on the internet, a draft US-Russia security agreement to avert a war. And at the time, the security <coughs> agreement said, don't expand NATO. Don't put your missiles close to our borders and implement the Minsk II agreement, which is a United Nations Security Council backed agreement for autonomy of the Russian speaking regions in the east of Ukraine, which the Ukrainian nationalists blew off and the United States said, yeah, don't worry about it. You don't have to follow through on a UN Security Council agreement. And Putin said, honor that agreement. Well, the basic story is, of course, the US refused to negotiate on these points. And on February 21st, 2022, there was a Russian Security Council meeting. You can find the minutes online again in the Russian government in English transcription or translation. President Putin calls on the foreign minister, <coughs> Sergei Lavrov, Minister Lavrov, give us a report on your diplomatic initiatives uh, in regard to our security. And Lavrov says, the United States has formally notified us that the NATO enlargement issue is non-negotiable, that it's none of our business. That was the final step before the Russian invasion on February 24th. We rejected every single diplomatic chance to avoid a war. And we thought, okay, our wonderful weapons and our, uh, our financial sanctions uh, will do Russia in. And by the way, you know, if I've been observing these kinds of things for 40 years. I wrote an article, it was, uh, I think in June actually, so it was a couple months after this saying that these neocon ploys are doomed to fail. The sanctions aren't gonna kill the Russian economy. The the wonder weapons are not going to defeat uh, Russia and so forth. So obvious 
So obvious if you've seen this uh, particular show repeatedly, as we have all the promises of our generals and the military industrial complex and all the rest wrong again and again and again. But what we did do was trap Ukraine in a devastating war between the US and Russia. So we provide the weapons, we provide, and I'll put it in quotation marks, the intelligence, because it's not very intelligent intelligence. And we tell them run to the front lines and tens of thousands of Ukrainians have died just in recent weeks <coughs> because of this. <coughs> An absolutely predictable bloodbath. And when the Ukrainians tried to negotiate with the Russians in March 2022, just after the start of the invasion, the US stopped the negotiations. And when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, said last fall, you know, maybe this is the time to negotiate. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who steps up? Secretary Newland, the endless neocon. It doesn't matter whether she's working for Cheney, whether she's working for Hillary, whether she's working for Biden, she's the perpetual neocon. She says, no, no, the time's not right for negotiations. What is the subtext of that? Well, a lot more Ukrainians have to die. And that's where we are right now. And this administration doesn't know what to do because all its great plans backfired. But Biden doesn't want to look weak. He's, you know, facing an election next year. So as usual, they just tell the Ukrainians, just keep running into the Russian lines. Just keep dying. It is the cliche fight to the last Ukrainian. And we even have senators like Romney say, you know, this is great. What's the problem? No Americans are dying. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what Romney says and what a lot of American leaders are saying. Yeah, we could put in $100 billion. What, what is that among friends in the military industrial complex? Of course, it means a lot to Americans who might care about their sustenance. But what they really think is, yeah, if the Ukrainians are ready to die for this, it, weak it weakens Russia and so forth. <coughs> and that's where we are till now. So my conclusion, we could have avoided this war entirely. We could have avoided loss of territory. We could have avoided everything because there was no demand for any of this until the US pushed and pushed and pushed and is tone deaf can't hear anyone else, doesn't believe anyone has red lines except the United States, and is on the path to do the same thing with Taiwan right now. And that's the war talk. So we're not out of this by any means. We're still in the midst of this neocon dominated American foreign policy. It it's what Kissinger famously said to be to be a, a foe of the United States is dangerous, but to be a friend is fatal. So we embrace our friends like Ukraine to the point of their destruction. And now we're angling or threatening or escalating in our tensions with China for a war over Taiwan. Unbelie I was just in Taiwan a couple of weeks ago. What a wonderful and beautiful place and very successful. And we are stoking a crisis by feeding it with armaments. So sorry to have talked so long, uh, but thank you for being the voices for peace and sanity and rationality in this country. Biden's asked for another 20 plus billion. This is our moment to say, stop, stop it already. Your reelection, actually, Mr. Biden, doesn't count compared to the lives you are wasting, the tens of thousands who will die because you don't want an embarrassment on your watch. It's not going to help your campaign to be in a war next year. Nobody wants this in the United States. 
We don't like this. This is dangerous. This is unnecessary. We don't support you, Mr. President, in this. So stop now. It'll be a lot worse in your campaign. The whole concept that you have to look tough and strong for your 2024, uh, 2024 re-election is a nonsense and it's profoundly immoral. So we need to raise our voice now. I think more and more congressmen and senators are getting the idea that while they don't ask us our opinions in the United States about these issues, because it's not really about what Americans think, it's about what the military industrial complex demands, we don't like it one bit. Thank you very much for letting me be with you this evening. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs, for joining us. As usual, it's been an enlightening <coughs> an educational experience to hear you and to be able to be with you this evening. Thank you. And we appreciate your being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for all your leadership. It's so important. And maybe you'll join us with some of our demonstrations. I'm I if I'm in this country and uh, and can do it, you can count on me. We need this right now so much to because this is the majority opinion of the American people without question. Thank you. And we need you to join us as veterans for peace. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. We're now going to everybody's favorite part of the program, led by Mike Ferner, Matt Southworth, and Zool. Thank you, Susan. I want to follow up on something that Professor Sachs mentioned a number of times, uh, that the neocons just went ahead, uh, they didn't really care to listen, on and on and on how many times he mentioned that theme. And I want to go back to a time in Baghdad in 2003, when I was there with Kathy Kelly and about 40 or 50 people from various nations who had gone to Baghdad before the U.S. invasion in a desperate, desperate hope that we could do something to stop the war that everybody saw coming. And on February 15th, all of the, everybody watching this right now will remember around the world, millions and millions of people turned out. It started in Australia and went westward around the entire globe. And millions of people were in the street, country after country. And there we were in Baghdad. And I was charged with meeting with uh, a small committee uh, that had another person on it who was from Brazil. And we were talking about how, what kind of a statement are we going to put together about why we're joining this demonstration when all these people around the world were part of it. And this person from Brazil looked at me and just knocked me off my feet. He said, you know, Mike, we don't have a peace and war problem. We have a democracy problem because the bastards never listened to us. And man, if that wasn't the truth, how many people turned out over 10 million easy around the world and that SOB in the White House and uh, uh, number 10 Downing Street went right ahead with what they wanted to do because that's what the elites and the military industrial complex said, this is what we got to do. So enough on that, but it's, it's uh, I, I'm so glad uh, Professor Sachs mentioned it like that. And one other thing before we get into picking your pocket here. Um, when Professor Sachs talked about the time when the, uh, and he was involved with this closer than probably anybody in the United States, with the time that the Soviet Union was about ready to fall apart and there was going to be an independent Russia and people in this country and, and people at this convention will remember, people in this country thought, oh my God, we're going to have a peace dividend. You know, we're not going to have this nonsense about the Cold War all the time. I was a member of Toledo City Council and our city was broke and we were dying to be able to provide for people 
and we knew where all the money was. And we were hoping that this peace dividend was finally going to make a difference. Well, you can blow that one out because you know what happened. But this is this issue has been with us for so long. And uh, our organization has been one of the few that tells the the current that we're swimming up against, tells the mainstream media, tells the the big hats, whoever, that we're going to stand up and tell the truth. And we do, and we do over and over. And it's wonderful to have people like Professor Sachs and Claire Daly and the other people that have spoken to us here. And to make sure this organization is able to continue, we're in the process of raising the kind of money it takes to keep an organization together and make sure we're able to have the impact that we need to have in this country. And so that's why I'm really happy to be interim director at this time and working with people like Zul and Matt, who are going to be on here in just a second. I want to introduce them. Matt Southworth uh, was good enough to come back uh, at Susan's arm twisting and be a, a board member again. And we're so glad. Uh, I didn't know uh, when I had known him a few years ago that his day job was in development and he was working for the Friends Committee on National Legislation in their development department. And now some people say he's gone to the dark side because he's working for a Harvard Foundation, but we won't make too much of that. But Matt is uh, back on the board and helping us get our development uh, chops together. And it's great to work with him. Zul, uh, be better known as Zul Zukowitz, but really Paul Harris Zukowitz, better known as Zul, is an associate member of Veterans for Peace, Chapter 34 in New York City, as well as a retired member of the Directors Guild of America. Zul has worked in every production capacity on more than 100 Hollywood on Hudson movies and television shows and is a lifelong eco-social justice and anti-war activist. He was recently appointed by Manhattan Borough President Mark Levine to Midtown Communities Board Number 5, making him the first registered Green Party member to become a part-time New York City public official. Subcommandante Zul is a member of the VFP Cash Cadre, and I suspect he's going to pick your pocket right about now. Yeah, we're going to do that. Matt, Matt and I have uh, got our, our uh, surgical gloves on and we are ready to perform this uh, wallectomy here. So um, thank you, Commandante Mike, uh, Madam President, um, Strong Buffalo, Ayate Hotanen, uh, Claire Daly, Jeffrey Sachs. What a wonderful evening. And it was last night as we kicked off too. Just a wonderful, wonderful organization this is. Um, the vice president of our New York chapter, uh, my dear friend Jerry Hassett, and I saw the um, new Broadway show, The Shock is Broken, this uh, past Wednesday, based on the um, movie Jaws. And uh, Jerry recently donated uh, $1,000 uh, for a lifetime membership. And I said to uh, Mike this morning, we're going to need a bigger bank. So it looks like um, PMAC donated another grand. It looks like uh, the money's coming in uh, faster than Ralph could uh, make this 10 grand uh, challenge uh, to us. And what's significant about that, and I'm going to say a few words about, um, about Ralph in a few minutes, but um, I want to ask Matt to talk first a little bit about the importance of sustainability. You know, Veterans of Peace is always linked supremacy, equity, militarism, and sustainability. And sustainability is very important to the renewed health and the growth of Veterans of Peace. So, uh, so Matt, would you uh, say a little bit about that, please? Absolutely. Thank you all. Uh, I'm I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Um, it was uh, just such a treat to hear Claire and Jeffrey. If if you weren't fired up by that, you should definitely check your pulse. Um, so VFP uh, is pulling itself out of a financially precarious um, position, and we are really working to rebuild and deepen our program and chapter support. 
And uh, I want to talk to you all about why uh, signing up for a monthly giving is a really great way to help us do that. Mainly, it, it gives us a reliable source of monthly revenue, uh, what we would call smoothing out the cash flow. And that does a few things. Number one, most importantly, it helps uh, Mike know uh, and whoever the future executive director is know that they have enough cash to cover really essential things like payroll and like uh, benefits and 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 program support, all that stuff. That is so essential. And and anyone who's been involved with nonprofits or an executive director of one knows that if if you lose sleep, it's probably over issues like that. So signing up to be a monthly sustainer, a sustainer, whether that is a five dollar donation, a twenty five dollar donation, fifty, a hundred, whatever you can do, is a tremendous way an absolutely tremendous way to help give financial stability to Veterans for Peace. We all know why that's so important to us. The chapters and members really are the beating heart of this organization. And, you know, we want to serve as your board and as the national office, as the circulatory system. We want to make sure that everything's connected and flowing. And we are really putting the empire back on its heels. The empire is stumbling right now. This is an opportunity for us to be very active and very loud and to voice the alternative world that we want to live in. The world we seek, one without war and preparation for war is possible. We can start today, may take 100 years. I don't know, may take less. I hope it takes a lot less. But the reality is we have to start somewhere and we're at a really excellent point right now to raise the profile and voice of Veterans for Peace um, through everything that all the chapters and uh, associate members do on a, on a weekly, on a daily basis, all the way up to the national office. Please be a part of this. The link um, is in the chat to sign up uh, for a pledge. Um, I will post right now the link to sign up uh, just to straight donate, and you can make that a monthly donation if you would like, literally of any amount. It makes such a difference, and I thank you. So thanks, Matt. And just so please, people understand, there are two links. So there's one for a pledge if you want to send a check or cash by carrier pigeon, but there's also uh, the donate link. And in the donation link, you can donate for a one-time pledge of any amount, or you can donate for a monthly sustainer pledge or a quarterly sustainer pledge of any amount. And what we'd like you to do now is to, to raise your hands. I mean, go to the bottom of your screen. Um, you know how to get to reactions. You've been to these Zoom calls before, every single one of you, and raise your hand. And we're gonna start calling on you and asking you um, to tell us what your, uh, what your pledge is. And I, I believe, Mike, um, are you gonna handle that? Uh, is that how that's gonna happen? No, we have a pledge sitting right next to me. <laughs> oh, well, let's hear it from her. My name is Sue Carter, and I'm going to pledge $25 a month. Wonderful. Thank you, Susan. So listen, I was saying before that um, that I wanted to say a few words uh, about Ralph Nader, but everybody can start, you know, go to your reaction button, raise your hand that way. You can raise your hand physically, and we're going to hear from you directly to what your pledges are. And you can see on your, your screen um, how to get started um, with the, uh, you know, the, the letter of intent form for plan giving. And then uh, we're going to make sure you see those buttons for the uh, donation, um, for the sustainer, and for the one-time giver. But, you know, Ralph's $10,000 pledge is a challenge, you know, but the challenge that he offers us is really more, you know, than money. You know, Ralph Nader has been such a man of sustaining integrity all his life. Um, he's probably the only presidential candidate since George Washington who actually told people the inconvenient truth. And we've heard a lot about that. And of course, you know, like Eugene Debs, you know, he campaigned on behalf of the working class. And the mission of Veterans for Peace has always been one of peace and to campaign for the least of these. So we have an ongoing mission. We need the money to do it, 
to heal this organization, to revitalize it, to build it. We're going to really want to build the membership. The one of ways we're doing that is, and we understand that not everybody has money to give, that maybe you have some time. So we have a cash cadre. So you could put your name and email in the chat right now, and uh, I'll probably get back to you and ask you and explain to you how to join that cash cadre. We won't be meeting more than once a month, but uh, we will be giving you um, a few uh, VFP members to call to thank them and to get feedback from them. But um, I'm looking now to see if we have some hands raised and um, who can see that. And uh, let's see if we can uh, hear from our next donor. We've got a lot of hands raised here. So go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. Sean Nestor. This is not a, this is not a, a meeting. It's a webinar. So for the okay. people who are not listed as panelists, you're going to have to give them permission to speak, which um, I'm going to give you the power to do, Matt. Okay, let's just do that once or twice then. So we'll we'll keep it uh keep it above board here. Okay. Um, uh, you have you got that right in front of you, Matt? I do. Let's see. Um I don't see the button for uh Well, what? I'll start oh, off. You know, I haven't got a lot got of money it. right now, but I'm going to pledge uh $10 a month. So uh so put me down. So and hey. Matt, what you're going to do is you're going to look I, at I've the got, attendees. I got it list. now, Ellen. I've okay. got it. Yeah, thank you. Sean, go ahead. I shut up. <laughs> I hear $10 a month. I'll match $10 a month. How about that? Incredible. Thank you so much. Can we get just to, just to go back a little bit? Is anybody out there who can uh, you know do what uh, Jerry Hassett and uh, PMAC did uh, earlier today? Anybody want to do a grand for a lifetime membership? I understand you can get yourself a nifty uh a brass membership card, and uh, we got a we got a lot of merch too. We got a a lot of premiums for twenty dollars a month. You get a silver and enamel Clausene Veterans for Peace pin. Uh, the commandant explained that means silver and enamel um, VFP pin, and then very very wonderfully we have at fifty dollars a month a handmade wooden dove plaque. This is created by hand in a workshop in Hanoi, in Vietnam, which is offering occupational and physical therapy to victims of Agent Orange. So can we see a hand for that $50 a month for the handmade wooden dove plaque made by people who suffered from Agent Orange? I'm, I'm gonna go to uh, I'm gonna go to Ken who just had his hand up um, to tell us about his pledge while we wait for the fifty dollar uh, hand. Ken, go ahead. Well, I've been a monthly uh, donor at a hundred a month for many years. I've got more lifetime memberships than I can possibly uh, use. I remind people they can give lifetime memberships to someone else as well. Uh, but I earlier put in the chat uh, in an earlier session that I'm giving $100 each day, another $100 each day of this convention. I've already done it for today, and I'm pledging to do it again tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Ken. Let me go to Jennifer Lim on, on uh, the chat. Jennifer has their hand raised. Go ahead, Jennifer. Hi, this is Jennifer Lim. Uh, yeah, I'm going to pledge um, $250 for this year. Wow, thank you so much. That's incredible, Jennifer. Thank you. Give that may lady a handmade uh, <laughs> duck black, please. That's right. And Mike, thank do, you you. Have, do you have and the And I, I want to remind everyone to, to check out Kennedy Robert Kennedy's website. Don't believe what the media is saying about him. He has taken a stand on peace and diplomacy. He has okay. a podcast thank with you. Jeff Sachs. Thank, thank you, thank you. you. Appreciate the, the words there. Okay, and now we're gonna go to um, Hollis Higgins. Go ahead, Hollis. What? Oh, you had your hand raised, so. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I think I clicked on that when I was doing reactions. All right. Like, well, that's too late. Too late. Uh, what, too, yeah. What, now, what, now we've signed you up. Can you give us Alice. today? Come on. I'll give you. A, I'll give you a, a hundred bucks. All right. Beautiful. We'll take it. Thank and you. That, and, okay. What do we got for that man, Mike? Have we got any uh, 
Come on, Dante. Did we get any swag from Ralph Nader to hand out to uh, to anybody today? We got uh, swag that's uh, supposed to go to lifetime members. Uh, we we got a uh, and I was supposed to have a sample. Unfortunately, I don't. You'll have to use your imagination. It's a Ben and Jerry's pen. That's a special pen that has a little button on it, and you pull it down. And it's got a pie chart of military spending. Now, there's not a lot of places that that will uh, you can where you can get that, but uh, we're going to have those Ben and Jerry pens uh, for people that are lifetime members. And uh, Zool already announced that uh, if you're going to give fifty dollars or more a month, you'll get the uh, handmade wooden plaque from the the workshop in Hanoi, and. Um, I do want to say that right there is the handsome brass membership card, lifetime yeah. membership card that you get if you become a lifetime member. So uh, uh, think about that. Um, we don't have swag for hundred dollar ones, but your swag is knowing you're doing the right thing for people. That, that's the truth. And Matt, I see my good friend Carmen Trotta has a raised hand. Uh, let's see. Yes. Come and try to go ahead. Carmen, do I have you there? Uh, we have we Carmen. Can, we can come back to Carmen and we know where okay, he lives. Sounds good. He's at the Catholic worker Joseph House in New York. We're going to get his money. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. Well, listen, I want to say two other things about the fundraising for VFP. So if you are over 71 and a half, you're required to take a minimum required distribution from your retirement account if you're lucky enough to have one. Those, if 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 you don't need all of that income, you can give part of that away for a charitable deduction. And it's a great way to not have it coming directly out of your pocket, but have it come out of your, um, your, your a fund that maybe... Uh, has a little more flexibility for you, and it makes a big difference to VFP. That's a that's a permanent tax benefit to you. Um, and the other thing is, if you're interested in including Veterans for Peace in your estate, shoot me an email, msouthvfp at gmail.com. I can help get that started for you. That's a really great way to create a legacy with this organization and to make sure that we know uh, that about that generosity so we can celebrate you and that generosity in your lifetime. We would love to be able to do that. So feel free. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, go ahead and and uh, reach out to me if you're interested in either of those things. And you know, Ralph Nader has been saying for decades that democracy is a daily exercise. And the exercise right now is to pony up. So I think there are a whole bunch of hands raised. So what have we got, Matt? All right, so let me go to Mike Dempsey. Michael. Michael? Unmute, Mike. Okay, let me let me go to uh, Russell Brown. Russell Brown. Go ahead, Russell, you can unmute. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Russell. I'm from Buffalo, Chapter 128. And I just donated about 20 minutes ago $1,000. Oh, we're, we're we have from, a winner. Uh, okay, Buffalo let's, is, Buffalo let's show is, that um, lifetime uh, brass membership card one wait, more time. Our, our chapter is operating in Buffalo, which is stolen land from the Senecas. Thank you. Okay, get that white out and let's put Russell Brown's name right in there right now. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, Russell. Who else, my? <laughs> All right, so let me go to, um, I got John G. Miller. Go ahead, John G. Miller. Sure, uh, so I'm from Chapter 101 in San Jose, and I'll I'll increase my uh, month, monthly donation. I, I'm currently giving 20. I'll increase it to 50. All yeah. the way from San Jose. And that you. gets you a handmade wooden dove plaque created in Hanai in a special workshop offering occupational physical therapy to victims of Agent Orange. Who else can go for that uh, wooden plaque? That's a very special thing. And think of all the work that our president has been doing for decade after decade to deal with Agent Orange. Next up, I got Matt Ho. Go ahead, Matt. 
Hey, absolutely great convention, guys. This is terrific. Uh, send me one of those wooden plaques for 50 bucks a month. Woo. Man. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. I'm going to I'm gonna go to Bob Rudy next. Bob. Hi, Matt. How you doing? Thanks. So, Matt, uh, Mike, uh, let's see. I, I only joined about four months ago. I, you know, I joined and uh, uh, committed, I think, $20 a month and uh, to match uh, to match uh, Ralph's uh, $10,000. I threw in another $200 uh, yesterday. So trying to do what I can mm -hmm. to help out. And we'll keep calling around to encourage other people to come on board. So and, thanks so and, much. It's been wonderful. And like we said, uh, you know, more than money is involved here. And Bob Rudy has been uh, a member of the cash cadre, and he's been That's dialing me. for those dollars, man. And we're just calling people. This is very easy to do. We're calling members. And uh, if they're already donating, ask them maybe to increase it. But more importantly, to thank people who've stayed with Veterans of Peace over the years and just to hear the feedback and hear how we can build a better Veterans for Peace, a bigger Veterans for Peace. A more I, was, uh, Veterans for Peace. I was glad to meet this organization uh, through the Golden Rule about four or five months ago. You're outstanding. I'm happy to be on board. Awesome. Oh, Thanks, Bob. And that's a good reminder. We're working on another piece of merch, a uh, premium for, a, for another uh, go round like this, so maybe in a couple of months, um, a model of the Golden Rule. So stand by. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, let me go to Nancy. I have Nancy's iPad. Go ahead, Nancy. Do I have Nancy? <laughs> Here's the... Uh, uh, <laughs> Mike has, has on screen some of the swag here. Yeah, I'll donate 100 bucks. Thank All you right. so much, Nancy. Yeah. Excellent. Wonderful. So listen, you know, we don't really care what size the donation is. We'll take anything of any size. We'd be extremely happy if you could give the most minimum amounts on a monthly basis or, or a quarterly basis, but we'll take anything. So um, please so, stop. There are a whole bunch of hands still. Yep. I've got, uh, let me go to Barbara next. Go ahead, Barbara. Barbara, unmute yourself if you if you can hear us. Okay, I'll come back to Barbara. Dave Logsden, go ahead, Dave. I'm unmuted. I'm Good. just showing you a little bit of. Uh, don't give me any swag. I got enough. <laughs> um, yeah, we're in uh, 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 Twin Cities Chapter Twenty Seven, and uh, and Mike Ferner knows. We got some deep pockets. We're going to give up 500 bucks. We've already put that in. So let's keep up the good work. Good, good job, folks. Let's go. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. Much appreciated. I'm going to go to Pat now. Pat um, Scanlon. Go ahead, Pat. There. Can you hear me? We've got you. Go ahead. Okay. So I, uh, the other day I sent in, uh, fifty dollars on on your the first time I saw it, but uh, now I'd like to up that. But there's a deal going on here, up that to a thousand dollars in a lifetime oh. membership. But give that man a brass membership. Uh, yeah, so, but but here's the here's the deal. Uh, I already sent in fifty, so I'd like to send a check for four fifty, and before Christmas I'll send in the other five hundred, somewhere Beautiful. in the time frame. We love it. We couldn't be more thankful. You know, uh, Elder Oren Lyons opened up for us last night, and I thought he was so brilliant. He was so beautiful. He told us how a man of peace appeared maybe 1,600 years ago and said, you know, this time is coming. He said, the, uh, and Oren said, you know, the future looks murky, but we gather here in peace. And as we gather in peace on this mission of peace, um, we do it with all the help from everyone on this call. A volunteer with the cash cadre, put your name in the chat. We're going to pick that up. But um, I see a lot more hands here. Yeah, let me let me go to Ellen next. Go ahead, Ellen. 
Well, the New York City chapter is not going to be outdone by Minneapolis. So 500 from the New York City chapter. Beautiful. Thank you so very much. And and when I said we're going to need a bigger bank, Ellen and Anthony, I, I mean a bigger credit union. <laughs> gotcha. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, I got Chris Berg. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I'd like to uh, have the South start to make some noise. I'm from North Carolina, and I want to, for the first time, pledge 15 a month. Thank wow. you so much, Chris. Thank you very much. That Thank means the house. world. Awesome. Okay, so I've got, let me go back to Mike Dempsey. Mike, do I have you now? You can unmute. Yeah, um, I made a hundred dollar donation yesterday, and I made another hundred dollar donation today. I made a pledge to do a hundred dollars a day uh, during the convention. Wow! And I'm also already a lifetime member, and I have an existing thirty dollar a month uh, donation, and I'll increase that to forty. Beautiful! Thank you so much, Mike, for your generosity. It really means everything. All right. Here's to all the lifers on the planet. <laughs> all right. Now, let me go to Lola. Go ahead, Lola. Hi. Um, I'm from the Joan Duffy chapter in Santa Fe. I'm an associate member. I am inspired by Ken and Patrick and Aria and Mike and whoever else was saying they want another lifetime membership. I would like that brass plaque, please. Bravo. Uh, Bravo. Another, Amazing. And I love the analogy of you guys being the circulatory system. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks Thank you. so much, Lola. Thank you. And Lola, you wrote something very beautiful in the chat earlier today about using words of peace when we talk together as opposed to words of war. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zul. I appreciate that because what I forgot to add was it affects our consciousness and then yes. it affects our path. Beautiful How words said. act on our consciousness. So thank Beautiful you. Said. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely, Lola. And words matter. That That's what we can say. I got Kara, Kara Bissell. Let me hear from Carol. Or Kara, pardon me. Kara, do I have you? Let me go back to Barbara. Barbara, are you there? So, so while folks are waiting for us to get, uh, you know, people's with hands raised up on the screen, uh, do go into the chat and do please volunteer for the cash cadre. Just a few calls a week make a big difference here. Connecting with members across the country, and I'm going to make a special plug as an associate member. For more associate members, hey, we're the lucky ones to have learned to stand against war without having to uh, to survive one. So, uh, and I thank everyone here, for such wonderful mentors around us. Yes. Uh, so, Kara or Carmen, both of you can speak. You're the last two to have your hand raised. If you're there, if yes, you I'm here. Can... Uh, go can ahead. you hear me, Kara? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead, Kara. Kara Bissell out of Tucson. Uh, Alice, my wife and I are uh, lifetime members. Uh, we just put in yesterday uh, with the caveat of being for the Ralph Nader uh, pledge, uh, $1,000 each. So Beautiful. that's our pledge. That's incredible. Thank you so much to both of you. Really Thank much you. appreciated. Oh, I see now I've got uh, Paul Cox. Let me bring in Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, Chapter 69 in San Francisco. I'm not really authorized to throw our money around, but if I can cajole our chapter into donating $500, I'll match it. Beautiful. Wow. wow. Yeah. This is about matching here today. We're all, we're all, you know, the challenge is to match, to match the money, to match that sustaining integrity, to match the, uh, the daily engagements in, uh, in, in civic life, to, uh, to match the love of the Commonwealth to helping meet the needs of the poor 
and to ending war. That's what we're about. Many of us are going to be here in New York on Sunday, September 17th, with the end, uh, uh, the march to end fossil fuels. Uh, a lot of us here on this call will be the, with the anti-militarism hub. So we hope to see you, uh, a lot of you here. Um, Nick Martin, one of our board members, has threatened to bring uh, his uh, drone model down um, so we can march against that. Uh, he's He, along with Kathy Kelly, co-chairs of the Band Killer Drones. So well, we've got a lot of associated groups here, World Beyond War. You know, uh, we had a great uh, board member from them yesterday. Yuri was on. And so just think of the incredible people who have enjoyed us just in this uh, first two thirds of the convention. So um, can we see some more hands? I see Carmen's hand still raised. I don't know if Carmen, you can unmute yourself. Do we have Carmen? Go ahead, Mike, jump in. Yeah. here. Uh, if I could get the name again of the couple from Tucson. Bissell. Uh, uh, it was uh, Kara Bissell. And, and they donated more than a Bissell. Yeah. <laughs> one, one, each, 1,000 each. That was wonderful. That's, uh, that's and, 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 and I didn't catch the other name. So if Kara could pop that other uh, name in the chat, that'd be great. That'd be very helpful. Thank you. And, and, so, and let me just, let me just say the, the Alice Bissell, Walker. Got it. Go ahead. Bissell's two lifetime memberships uh, got us up to Ralph's $10,000 pledge. Wow. So beautiful. And but we're not going to stop now, are we? We're not going to stop there, but let me tell you, we have an anonymous donor uh, who wants to donate two lifetime memberships. One, wow. one is for Julian Assange. Wow. Uh, and we're in touch with his legal team, and we're going to make sure that when he gets out, one of the first things he gets is that brass membership card. And the other lifetime membership, this uh, anonymous donor, wants to give is for an organization called Water Justice for Palestine. So there's wow. another 2,000 there. That's so wonderful to hear, Mike. Thanks for bringing that um, to to us. Uh, I'm I'm really couldn't be happier uh, with the generosity and the way everyone on this call has stepped up. I know there are people who may not feel comfortable stepping up uh, and telling us what they're doing, and I and I I thank you as well. I see you out there. I know you're out there, and I thank you. It means so much to us to have your support in this way. This is what keeps the lights on. This is what keeps keeps us um, running. We really do run on generosity, your generosity, and dues, and the grit of people who have survived hell and back. So it's incredible. This has been uh, wonderful, and I hope you'll continue to use the pledge form and the gift form and my email and Zul's email and get in touch if you want to volunteer to make calls for Cash Cadre. I'm going to make it very easy for you. I'll I'll add new calls. You'll you, It's at your pace. You can do two a week. You can do 10 a week, whatever you want to do. And all we're doing is reconnecting with our members and asking them to, to consider supporting VFP this year. That's all we're doing. It's the e They're the easiest and best calls uh, for a lot of folks um that that one can make so i i hope we'll we'll get some volunteers uh to do that as well again thank you so very much to everyone we have a lot of ongoing projects that are doing well and we'll do better with your help we want to hear from you about new projects that we should get involved with and this is a good moment to remember our first honorary lifetime member harry belafonte uh, presente. And uh, of course, we want to say the same uh, following uh, uh, Marjorie Cohn's wonderful remarks, um, remembering Dan Ellsberg yesterday, Dan Ellsberg presente. So um, do we want to go any further, um, Mike? Let, let me just say that, um, well, we'd love to have people go further. The uh, donation links, if you just scroll up the chat a little bit, there'll be the link in there to make a uh, immediate online donation or become an immediate uh, sustainer. That's in one link. The other link is if you want to pledge to give something between now and the next few months, uh, there's another pledge link in there. But the thing that I want to say is that uh, Ken Mayers, who said earlier that he has more lifetime memberships than he'll ever be able to use up, uh, it has a few words to tell us about uh, legacy giving 
And if there was ever uh, uh, a membership of an organization that uh, has a lot of people who are going to need some place to unload some cash before they go, it's this one. So, Ken? <laughs> Thanks very much, Mike. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen if I can do it successfully. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> We can see it, Ken. Have you got the um, PowerPoint showing? Just your desktop. It Your desktop is what's showing. I've got a nice little PowerPoint show here, and I can't get that up. Got PowerPoint open. Okay, here we go. Hopefully. We've got it. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, folks. Um, I'm probably a little closer to this scene than most of the members. Um, I'm 86. I've got a head start on probably the majority of you. Uh, but I've got news for you. Uh, we're all going to die. And <laughs> I know that's shocking, but we've got to get used to the fact. And the thing is, we can sustain, and there's that beautiful word again, sustain Veterans for Peace, even when we're not around to respond to wonderful uh, pitches, just as uh, Zul and Matt gave us. Uh, and so we do have a legacy program in, in Veterans for Peace plan giving program. And the most obvious way, and the one that people think of first, of course, is a will, but it's not the only way. Whoop. Thank you. Are, the most common ways are a will, life insurance, living trust, retirement plan assets, charitable remainder trusts. And I won't get into the more sophisticated ones. You all know how to how to either get at the means of making a will or talking to a lawyer who would be more than happy to write one for you. There are a couple of simple ones that most people aren't aware of, and that's payment on death or transfer on death. And that has to do with uh, bank accounts or other assets you may own where you can specify in the account, your bank account, you can go to your banker and say, well, if there's any money left in this account when I die, payment on death to Veterans for Peace. Uh, if you have some property that can be transferred, you can do a transfer on death in the title to the property uh, for Veterans for Peace. And how to get started, it's real easy. Uh, if you've included VFP in your estate plan, uh, you should have a memorandum of agreement to says ex ex expresses exactly how you want it to be used. You can be used for general support. It can be used for uh, one of the national projects. Whatever you see fit, you can put in a memorandum of agreement. Whatever you decide to do, the first step is very easy. You complete the letter of intent form which can be found on the VFP website by searching for plan giving, or you go to the link I've got there at the bottom, and I will put that again in the chat. <clears throat> That's all you have to do. And if you have questions about it, you can contact me, Ken Mayers at vfp-santafe.org. I'll put that link in the chat as well. I encourage you all to Keep your legacy going with Veterans for Peace. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, thanks for getting off the screen there. Um, I'm going to just go into the chat here, and I, I just want to thank some folks. I, I know a lot of people let us know what they were doing by chat, and uh, I... I uh, I couldn't do all the functions at once, plus be the good looking one. So I've got to go through the chat here now. Let me just say. Got that right, Matt. <laughs> Ellen, Ellen E4PJ, uh, thank you for your donation. I saw um, 
Let's see. We've got Dan Shea in there. Thank you so much, Dan. Good to hear from you. Uh, Dan and I, when we last served on the board, we roomed a lot together, so we got to know each other. Uh, Dirk uh, Lakovich, thank you so much for your pledge, for your donation. Um, Patrick McCann said Rob Mumford, uh, Mulford from Alaska gave a thousand. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, uh, let's see. We've got, of course, um, uh, let's see. I'll keep going here. I'm not going to get to everybody, but let's see. Uh, Jerry Condon, uh, let us know. Um, they're going to be donating uh, monthly. Thank you so much. Uh, I see John G again. I know John G spoke. Uh, Elsa, um, uh, uh, thank you so much for your monthly donation. Um, and let's see. James Ryan, thank you. The chat goes on and on. Uh, Doug Ryder, uh, again, I'm just overwhelmed by this generosity. Yeah, uh, Matt, I, Matt I, think, I, miss. I, think you, I think you should keep going, but I just want to point out that Ken Mayers just put his email and a URL in the chat. So go that if you have any questions about lifetime uh, memberships, about legacy, anything in that order, please contact Ken. And listen, we can't guarantee that will get you into heaven. We can't even guarantee that there is a heaven, but we know there's no there's no beer there. There's beer here. And if you have pledged today in any amount, go crack yourself a cold one. And if you haven't pledged today, don't get that drink just yet. So <laughs> please continue, Matt. Yeah, no, I think I got I got pretty much everyone there. Um, so yeah, the very good caveats though. Um you're, but nonetheless, everyone's generosity is so much appreciated. I did see Ann Wright also gave earlier as well. Thank you, Ann. Um, hey, Colonel. And, and anyone else I miss, thank you so very much for the generosity. It really means the world. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, let me just say that with the money that has come in uh, matching Ralph's, and uh, we're over that $10,000. So I'm guessing, and we'll have some totals hopefully by, before the conference is over, that were probably uh, around uh, 20,000, 25,000. And one of the things that we want to do is put on staff to fill a vacancy, somebody who's going to organize with chapters to get our chapter contacts together, to get members in the right chapter, to organize with members wherever they are, whether they're in a chapter or not, to do the sorts of things that we need to do to build and to grow and retain members. Uh, that's something that we have to do and we know that. And now we have the ability to do it through your generosity. So thank you so much. That's amazing. That's your money at work right there, folks. We are putting it right back out there and, and getting uh, rebuilding this organization to do all the many important jobs that we need to do at this critical moment. We are at a very critical moment in time and a moment in history, and we all get to have an impact on that. It feels great. I hope you feel I see, it too. I hey, see Matt, I'm going to jump in here and say Mike Torque in El Salvador just ch just weighed in in the chat for a thousand dollars. Okay, we're not taking pesos though, Mike. <laughs> Thank you so Mike much, Mike. I hope Mike knows it can't come out of the treasury. <laughs> I just want to uh, say. Um, Matt has been an incredible um, development director. He has given us so much good advice and has really set up this uh, cash cadre so well. We're having a lot of fun with that. So please, please volunteer and join us. It's going to be a brief meeting, you know, once a month. What do we set up? The uh, first or second Monday a month? We'll figure that out. We'll let you know. Please put your email in the chat. And uh, the Commandante has really been tickling the people on our uh, board of advisors, as you see. And rumor has it that uh, someone else will be coming forward before very long with yet another matching fund for those of you who prefer to make your donations at the end of year in time for tax deduction. So um, if your pockets aren't empty right now, um, you know, give us another few shekels, but, um, but save your pennies because we're coming back at you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I, and just, I see Tarek, uh, made another pledge in the chat. Thank you, Tarek. And, and, uh, Ellen E for PJs, Ellen Barfield. Thank you, Ellen, for your donation. Um, these, these people are unrelenting, you know? <laughs> well, like I said, grit and tenacity, that's what we're running on here. Um, so, uh, anything, uh, more Mike, 
Um, anything more you want to say here on this in our remaining moments? Just a huge thank you. And uh, I'll let Susan take it. Um, if we're, uh, she has some final words or if we're ready to go into the, the music portion or whatever's next here. But uh, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, we love this organization. We know we have an important voice in this country and every dollar that you're giving is gonna help us amplify that voice and try to save us from the mad men. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I don't think that we've ever had so much fun giving money before. So thank you, Mike, Matt, Zool. It's been terrific. We go now to a more serious part of the program with Barry Reich and Presente. Barry. Yeah, hello, everybody. That's a tough act to follow. <laughs> you know, uh, great to see everybody pledging, but it definitely tested my patience. But the, uh, anyhow, thanks so much for Professor Sachs and uh, Claire, really great speeches. You know, uh, I'm sorry that we don't have more time. Everyone, every name that I'm going to mention is a life, a unique life. They all have a great story to tell. They're great people because they belong to Veterans for Peace, you know. We're truth seekers, you know. People want to know the truth, they should be coming to us. And we're, we're the best source of the truth in the world. So anyhow, you know, like I say, I would like to spend time on each individual name. We just ha don't have time for it. So I'm just going to call off the name. By the way, I will probably miss some names. So if you got a name, put it in the chat. If you think that it hasn't been sent forward, we'll, we'll go through the chat at the end. I'm going to call the names. We'll say Presente at the end of it. I'll do a tolling of the bells like we do in Minnesota. We always we do graveside service with the tolling of the bell, bell versus the rifle volley. We do that. Uh, you know, we learned to do that after the November 11th each year. We gather and ring the bells, remembering that the war to end all wars. And so we do it for people that work, spent their life working for peace. Okay, so that being said, and I, I just, uh, a lot of times we have the, where the chapter is, but this year they're just the chapter numbers. Andrew Sharkey, chapter 57, Presente. George J. Andrew Zewiski, excuse, excuse me, I'm missing it too. too. Andrew, George Andrew Zewiski, VFP chapter 21. Nicholas J. Seca, doesn't, doesn't mention chapter. Presente. Pat Reisinger, ch Chapter 27. Presente. Donald L. Darling, Chapter 66. Presente. Jewel Johnson, Chapter 66. Presente. George Johnson, Chapter 182. Presente. Jim Skillman, Chapter 125. Presente. Al Otha, Chapter 19. Presente. Francis J. Coyle, Chapter 157. Iris Edbener, Chapter 1, Chapter 7. Bob Stebbins, Chapter 132. Joseph Acevedo, Acevedo Chapter 112. Robert Prokop, Chapter 105. Will Covert, Independent. Dennis L. Waters, Chapter 160. George W. Ross, Chapter 162. Daniel Ellsberg, of course, Advisory Board. David Zink, Chapter 134. Ed Eduardo Castro, Chapter 180. Albert Rich, Chapter 113. Jim Harvey, Independent. Bob Carpenter, Chapter 34. Gordon Smith, Chapter 46. Joel Paline, Chapter 27. And it looks like we've got some chats. Paul Drodos, Chapter 115, Presente. Arabella Fonte is yours past. Presente. Presente. Anybody else? Is that it? Okay. Thanks, everybody.
I'm going to do my bell ringing. I'm thankful we take the time to do this each year. Remember our family that's passed. Barry, there's a couple more that have just come into the chat. Okay. Okay. Fred, uh, Francis Gordon, Collins. I, I said I said Gordon. Ken Farr, chapter nine, presente. Mason Richards is that chapter ninety-two, presente. Anybody else? Okay. And we continue to work for these people. You know, they may be past, but they're still with us in spirit. Carry on. There are some more in the chat, Barry. Oh, okay. More. Uh, okay, John Manaheim, Chapter 9, Presente. Bob Phillips, Tucson, Presente. more we couldn't hear the bell for some reason you couldn't hear my bell the whole that's system. because that's because zoom probably takes the pitch and shuts it out if you don't have your original uh, sounds for musicians setting set i can bring it you want me to stand back further try it yeah well no i think you have to have your original sound for musicians setting set so okay. that's it. You have, well, well, have to do it from your imagination. Okay. Bong, bong, bong. There's Marty doing it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Before we begin the award ceremony with Josh Shirley, Mike Ferner and I, on behalf of the Veterans for Peace Board of Directors and VFP members, would like to take a couple of minutes to honor Shelly Rocket. Shelly, are you here with us tonight? The Veterans for Peace Board is proud to recognize Shelley Rocket for her 13 years of incomparable service and dedication to Veterans for Peace, our mission and our membership. Shelley's positive attitude is remarkable and makes her exceptionally good at solving problems and overcoming difficulties that would confound anybody else. To her, difficulties are simply earning opportunity, learning opportunities. She has been the voice of Veterans for Peace to thousands of members over the years who call with questions and ideas, and she is unfailingly responsible to the endless requests from our members and the board. No matter how long the day, Shelley only quits when the job is done. Without her help during this transition period, things would have been much harder and certainly not as successful. Shelley volunteered to take a reduction in compensation and expanded her responsibilities with the job of office manager. Beyond that, she has been the main person to hold Veterans for Peace together any number of times in her 13 years with us. Shelly is simply an invaluable part of VFP. We are immensely grateful to her for her dedication, hard work, and good cheer. Veterans for Peace, 
wouldn't be the same or even maybe wouldn't be in existence without her. Thank you, Shelley. Mike Ferner. Well, thank you, Shelley. And uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Shelley since she started and uh, getting a chance to work with her again. And uh, Shelley, just so you don't think that this was just a bunch of nice words and uh, what else are you gonna get out of this? Um, we in Veterans for Peace are going to mark Shelley Rocket Day annually, which will be a paid holiday for Veterans for Peace staff and we hope we can spread this into a national holiday at some point, but we're going to start with the Veterans for Peace staff and have an annual Shelley Rocket Day at VFP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you. you have I have tears in my eyes. So I don't want to speak. I have tears in my eyes. Thank you to everyone. I enjoy doing what I do. And I am so glad that you all are enjoying this convention. Thank you, Shelley. I'll turn the program over now to Josh Shirley, who starts with the awards. Thank you. All right, I'm Josh Shirley from the board, and I have the honor of kicking off the awards portion of our 2023 convention. Um, so this is the time when where we honor the achievements, commitment, and sacrifice of our beloved members and those who inspire us to get out there and expose the true cost of war. And um, what is that? Do you guys hear that? I think it's everybody clapping for Shelly. So yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Shelly, for everything. Um, all right, so what we've done is we've asked that folks who nominated someone for an award uh, record a brief video talking about the awardee and, and why they're being recognized. Um, some of these videos are more brief than others, but that in no way indicates that any you know one award or awardee is any more or less valuable than any other. Uh, in fact, so many of you more than deserve recognition for the work that you continue to do, and we're eternally grateful um, for that. We want to acknowledge that, so thank you. Um, so first, uh, we will hear from our uh, chapter of the year, and as someone from a smaller VFP chapter, this one is especially near and dear to my heart, right? Uh, we, we, we like to honor the, uh, the superstar chapters from time to time, but we thought it would be important to pay tribute to some of our smaller chapters that, so th that although smaller in number, in many respects, makes up the, uh, the heart and soul of our mission here at VFP. Uh, then we'll get into the four individual awards, right? We're looking at the Service and Stewardship Award going to a couple of folks in Nashville, uh, which is given to someone having performed exemplary service in support of the well-being of veterans and their families while advancing the culture of peace uh, locally, nationally, or internationally. And these folks certainly have done that. Uh, next, we'll look at the Leadership in Peace Award given to someone that has displayed initiative, inclusiveness, and tireless perseverance in moving forward the mission of VFP. Then we'll move on to the Gandhian Nonviolence Award, given to a member who best exemplifies the qualities of compassion and selfless service, according to Mohandas K. Gandhi's philosophy, that the highest form of service is rooted in love and nonviolence. And then lastly, we'll take a, an extended look at the member that's receiving our 2023 Howard Zinn Lifetime Achievement Award, bestowed upon the person who has made significant and ongoing contributions to the cause of peace over their lifetime. Um, Howard Zinn, of course, a remarkable human and advocate for peace and justice, uh, whose birthday actually just passed. Um, Professor Zinn would be 101 years old today as of this past Thursday. Uh, so an award is in his honor is given each year and we'll see an extended video with the short interview done with that recipient at the conclusion of the video that is about to play. And before I start, I wanted to ask if everyone had heard about the um, the uh, missing farmer, the farmer who missed uh, the award ceremony. Um, yeah, he missed it, but don't worry, they found him. It turns out he was outstanding in his field. So, <laughs> there's that. All right, I had to throw that in. Um, so with that, um, on behalf of the VFP board, congratulations to the following recipients. And without further ado, let's hear about our 2023 award winners. Go ahead and roll it.
Hello everyone, Sarah Campbell here as President Emeritus of Chapter 97 here in Kansas City, Missouri. I've been given the honor of accepting this year's Veterans for Peace Chapter of the Year Award. We are immensely grateful to be recognized for our dedication to the cause of peace building. We rebuilt a struggling chapter in part by joining into coalitions with allied groups to host and table local events and actions. Also by issuing each member their own Veterans for Peace flag to have at the ready for those events and actions. This is certainly an unexpected honor that we are so thankful to receive. Thank you, Sarah Campbell, thank you, Sarah. and thank you, thank Veterans you, for Peace. Hello, my name is Rhonda Shelton and I am the president of the Hector Black Chapter of Veterans for Peace here in Nashville. And it is my pleasure to present the 2023 Service and Stewardship Award to Harvey Bennett and Jim Walgermuth for their work with Veterans for Peace Radio. Veterans for Peace Radio is a radio broadcast that highlights topics that are pertinent to the American public and to veterans. Such topics include the privatization of the VA, racism in the military, the true costs of war, and the military industrial complex. It's been a pleasure knowing Jim and Harvey for five years. They have been very active in various campaigns and protests here in Nashville, and they inspire me to keep up the fight for peace and for veterans' rights. So I'd just like to say congratulations to Jim and Harvey for this award. Congratulations, gentlemen. Hello, I'm Leslie Butterfield. I'm David Butterfield. And we're here to tell you about our dad, Gary, Gary Butterfield. Butterfield. So for a long time, our dad has held various leadership roles with VFP, including as former president of the Hugh Thompson Memorial Chapter, Chapter 91, San Diego, and as treasurer of the National Board. And most recently, he's been working really closely with the Climate Change and Militarism Project. And locally, he makes sure to honor and recognize the contributions and long-standing efforts of a lot of the members of the Chapter 91. More recent years, one of his projects, or one of the things he's been working on, is to make sure that VFP gets out of the silo of just VFP. And so he's been connecting VFP and other peace and activist groups like um, 350.org, Extinction Rebellion, and Green New Deal. One of his pet projects lately has been the No Mass campaign which means no Miramar air show, um, protesting on Thursdays, the Blue Angel air show, which is an egregious uh, demonstration of air pollution. And it's only for entertainment and it glorifies war for kids and no mas is what we say. No more. Um, he's inspired other chapters to carry out their own versions of this type of protest against air shows in their areas. And most recently we've been hearing a lot of really good stuff coming out of Seattle, trying to end, I think, the sea fair. Uh, he's been doing this for a really long time and in the past few years he's actually seen more of an uptick of support as he's been able to link climate change to uh, air pollution and militarism before it was just uh, peace and now we're doing a lot more. Throughout COVID he's been working with CCMP Climate Change and Militarism Project to raise awareness about the military's outsized impact on climate change being the largest fossil fuel consumer in the world. And during that he was able to zoom across the country and maybe you've seen him in a Zoom room. Um, he's been speaking with just about any group, classroom, community, who would have him. And he also helped create a shareable product that people could take to their own organizations and present it with the slideshow and raise the awareness that way. Generally speaking, he's like a really great guy. And we're very lucky to have him as our dad. We love you, daddy. Congratulations. Way to go.
Hi, my name is Becky Looning, and I am honored to present this year's Gandhian Nonviolence Award to Pat Alviso on behalf of Veterans for Peace. Pat's selfless service to military families and veterans, her mentoring of youth, and her relentless efforts to expose the human costs of war make her the perfect candidate for this award. Pat's husband, Jeff Merrick, is a 20-year Air Force vet and both of them are longtime members of Veterans for Peace in Long Beach, California. Pat serves as the National Coordinator for Military Families Speak Out, and Jeff serves as the group's treasurer. Their work has been intertwined with Veterans for Peace for years, and if you've been to a VFP in-person convention, there's a very good chance you have met one or both of them. Pat's compassionate activism springs from her experience as a teacher and as a mother. When Louis Rapprager nominated Pat for this award, he cited the countless hours she has dedicated to after-school peace clubs where high school kids in vulnerable communities can broaden their worldview and learn about alternative non-military avenues for their futures. Her 40 years in the classroom led her to serve on the steering committee for the National Network Opposing the Militarization of Youth, and she has been able to distribute her peace club curriculum through that network. Pat has also been a key organizer of her chapter's Teen Memorial, an Arlington West-like display representing the over 500 18 and 19 year olds who lost their lives in post 9-11 wars. I don't know, maybe it's the t-shirts that she's always wearing, but Pat Alviso is most recognized in her role as the National Coordinator for Military Families Speak Out. MFSO is a national organization for families who have or have had loved ones in the military since 9-11. Pat's compassion and care for veterans, military families, and Gold Star families draws from her own experience as the mom of an active duty Marine. She has created many opportunities for veterans and their families to speak out, including leading three delegations of military families to the White House. And she has mentored interns to develop leadership skills by working with MFSO. In 2011, Pat organized a Southern California contingent to travel to Sacramento to participate in the Poor People's Campaign's National Call for Moral Revival. There, they spoke to the poverty of many military families and the need for increased benefits, and then got arrested during the direct action. Pat also actively supports U.S. Unified Deported Veterans and has traveled to Tijuana numerous times to meet with deported vets and advocate their repatriation as well as to speak up in defense of veterans who are being threatened with deportation. In short, Pat Alviso has been at the forefront of intersecting movements for peace and economic justice, raising her voice and helping to lift up the voices of veterans and other military family members to talk about the true costs of war, supporting those who are most impacted and working hard to counter the poverty draft. Her nonviolent actions, rooted in love, speak clearly of a life dedicated to caring, not warring. Thank you, Pat, for all your good work and congratulations. This year's Lifetime Achievement Award goes to Mr. Freddie Champagne, long-term member of Veterans for Peace, active long before Veterans for Peace got started. And Freddie, uh, congratulations. Um, maybe you could tell us how you became an anti-war activist. I came home uh, early uh, and being one of the first uh, vet, combat vets to speak at my college, all of the radical groups always put me up to speak. And we shut down our University of South Florida and Tampa many times. But after a while of demonstrations and being kicked out of school for inciting to riot, I moved to California. I ran into some veterans that were working on organizing a project. 
uh, in Nicaragua. I wanted to do something similar in Vietnam. We were a group organizing to work in Vietnam before we were a Veterans for Peace chapter. But we ran into some VFP members coming through town with the Veterans Peace Convoy. And so in uh, early 88, we formed a chapter, Chapter 22 in Garberville. We believe we're the smallest town in America with a chapter. There's not even a stoplight in our town. But we began working in Vietnam. We got permission to bring teams of veterans. We got a license from the Treasury Department organized the project and went and built a medical clinic in Buong Tau, opened on April Fool's Day, 1989. Uh, the publicity was, was aimed towards getting the embargo lifted and getting Americans back in and out of Vietnam to see the war had ended and work on issues of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, the Veterans Vietnam Restoration Project lasted 26 years. How many delegations did you send? Uh, the VVRP sent 26 teams, one every year. Wow, that's excellent. Um, and then subsequent to that, you did a number of other things. Uh, you went to Cuba with baseball diplomacy, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. That's one of my uh, many trips to Cuba. We started working in Cuba to, aimed at lifting the embargo of Cuba. After the embargo of Vietnam was lifted, we thought, well, let's get the embargo lifted there. Uh, in the process, we decided to take a little league baseball team there. And we took a little league team that played three games in Havana, lost all three games. Uh, we got a chance to meet Fidel and we were very well received because we had been helping some little league teams there in Havana. And to get to play in a big stadium in Havana was a real treat. Uh, our last game, we managed to mix up Cubans and Americans to play the game. And it was really fun with the language mix-ups. And you organized some bus trips? Uh, we were always, always organizing bus trips, either across the country to uh, a, a convention in Boston or uh, delivering buses to other Cuba groups, or we were at the School of America's protest, the WTO protest. Uh, we took a bus down to Chiapas and back, uh, 6,000 miles in 30 days. Uh, and we always uh, tried to work with the conventions. We often would take 12 uh, veterans uh, cross country to a convention in St. Louis or Minneapolis or somewhere. Uh, many chapters have seen our buses come through town. Um, and then the Iraq Water Project, if you would talk about that. The Iraq, Iraq Water Project grew out of, uh, I had a chance to go with Ramsey Clark's Iraq Sanctions Challenge delegation. And during that period, I had a chance to see the Baghdad water treatment plant and was lectured about water treatment problems. Uh, on the way home from there, with uh, Edelis Eckhart of Chapter 56, our board president, we schemed up a plan to take a team to uh, Iraq and began rebuilding Iraq as a way to challenge the American sanctions that were put in place. The sanctions weren't hur hurting Saddam Hussein, the sanctions were hurting the people. And by choosing a water treatment plant, we were helping get clean water to that area south of Basra. And uh, there are many, many other things that you've done as an anti-war activist, but I think uh, I'd like to wrap it up with what you and Sherry Champagne did with the Golden Rule. Well, I was uh, uh, advised there was a peace boat in my backyard. And it turns out it was 90 miles away, but there was a dilapidated peace boat lying on the beach at Zerlog's Marine in uh, near Eureka, Humboldt Bay. I was the one that chose to restore it. Uh, several people had looked at it and decided it wasn't worth saving. It was pretty broken up. It had been sunk twice and recovered from under the water. No mast, no engine, and so forth. It took five years, but we built a beautiful boat with lots of support from chapters, members, and other persons, especially Quakers, 
and other veterans contributed. And I'm really pleased to see it on the road. We've always thought of the boat as a, a membership magnet for Veterans for Peace, to sail around, protest the nuclear-powered submarines, the missiles on the Trident subs, the aircraft carriers, and nuclear plants, bomb-making plants in general, in an anti-nuclear ship. It was once an anti-nuclear ship in 58, and that's where it came from, and that was its fame, trying to stop the nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands in 58. I remember you showing up at all the conventions raising money, and I would never give you any money because I said, it's a hole in the water we're going to pour money into. And it's been that, but it has been an extraordinary project. So, Freddie, if anybody deserves a Lifetime Achievement Award, it's you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to all the Veterans for Peace members that have supported us over the years. All right. Well, that concludes the awards uh, portion of our program. Um, thanks to the awardees, those who nominated them, and the folks who worked hard to make us these uh, outstanding videos, especially uh, Ellen, Becky, uh, Chris. Thank you. Uh, and of course, special thanks again to Shelly Rocket, and many thanks to all of you for being with us today. Uh, another great day as we gather, raise funds, and talk about the vital work that stands before us. Uh, before we move over to the music session, I think Mike Ferner has a few uh, parting words. Thanks. Thanks very much, Josh. And uh, thank you for all the work that you put in uh, to putting those awards together and everybody that worked on that committee. Um, I, I'm sure by now people have a idea of how many people it takes working together to make something like this happen. So thank you all very, very much. Um, well, believe it or not, uh, before we started the fundraising, uh, we were supposed to have a uh, uh, featured guest stop in to uh, urge you to empty, empty your wallets. And uh, it was left to Zool and Matt to, to do the job, which they did okay. But uh, here is a video that was taped earlier today and did not come in until after we got the fundraising done from Ralph Nader. This is Ralph Nader. We've proposed a $10,000 matching grant to the Veterans for Peace in order to reduce its impoverishment and give it more capacity to support their great agenda here in this country and around the world. And anybody who adds a $1,000 contribution, uh, I'll be very pleased to send them a copy autographed of my fable called How the Rats reformed the Congress. It's designed to make people laugh themselves seriously. And the bulk of the book shows how people can mobilize to take control of Congress away from the giant corporations. And if that occurs, we have a different country, a different people, a different economy, a different level of happiness, prosperity, and security, and safety. And also, I will send this classic pen. It's now a collector's item created by Ben Cohen of Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream when he got into his bus all over the country to educate people about the vast, wasted, bloating military budget. This is about 15 years ago. And the ratios are still the same. On one side, it's how much we spend compared to other countries. We now spend as much on military uh, as, as the next 10 largest military budgets, including China and Russia. And on the other side, it's how the military budget compares with spending on health, education, and other domestic needs. And it's a great discussion starter. You can generate a lot of con conversations. And I'll bet you Ben Cohen We'll update it if he gets enough feedback that people are using this priority pen. Yours with this autograph for a thousand dollar contribution to Veterans for Peace, deductible. 
Let this well-organized virtual convention of the Veterans for Peace result in every participant on the Zoom conference getting before the end of the year another veteran to join the Veteran for Peace. You'll double your number. You'll increase the possibility of having a full-time lobbyist on Capitol Hill for the Veterans for Peace, whose agenda is unexcelled in terms of its range, depth, humanity, strategic purposes for a more peaceful world by people who have known war since World War II all the way to the present. Simply get another veteran to join Veterans for Peace. And in the process, see if you can dig deep up to the point where it doesn't hurt and contribute more deductible grant or donations to Veterans for Peace. And third, try to get a few of the veterans that are really wealthy around the country to back Veterans for Peace. And thanks, especially to Mike Ferner, the interim director for Veterans for Peace. And have a very successful evening. Well, thank you. Mike for... had not seen that video, so he did not know he was getting plugged. No, I didn't. I didn't. Thank you, Ralph. And uh, uh, I will be in touch with him first thing next week and let him know how much we appreciated that. Uh, we had arranged to have him tape this and the, his schedule must have got goofed up and we didn't get it in until moments ago. So that's why you're seeing it after the fundraising, but what a hell of a job he did. And uh, take his words to heart, the guy knows what he's talking about. So, okay. All right, uh, at this point, uh, we're going to go to the music portion of the convention. And Paul Cox uh, has been in charge of that. Um, some people have said all of Paul's taste is in his mouth, so I can't really tell you for sure what kind of music you're going to get, but uh, he's put a lot of work into it, so be kind to him. Paul? Yay, Paul. <laughs> I'm here somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. I, I can't spotlight him. He's not a panelist, but I want to oh. tell people... I want to tell people the music session, you have to get out of this webinar and we're going to, I'm going to put the link in the chat for um, the, this is the music link. The music is scheduled to start at nine. We might get it going a little earlier, but we need a little time to organize it. So that's nine. the link and we'll see you soon. What? Thank you. <laughs> what? <laughs> Paul, we're going to the music room as soon as Ellen can get it set up, which is a little but, but I got my dancing thank shoes you. on. And thank you. Nine Eastern. I'm sorry. I'm a I'm a localist. Uh, okay. Nine six. Eastern. Right, half an hour. Six, half, half six an hour. California. Half an hour. Right. Okay. <laughs> and and Ellen Barfield gives us all the advice. Take a break, have a beer, take a pee, grab a snack. And we'll see you in the music room. Thank you all very much. This has been great.